Dias Moireb and Yaki Da. This is Ken Russell bringing you his ABC of British music, a musical alphabet, as English as John Ireland, as Welsh as Edward German, and as Scots as Paul McCartney's The Mull of Kintyre. Let's go. A starry entertainment that takes the lid off the pressure cooker of our musical heritage. A is for Thomas Arne, anthems and the Albert Hall. Last night of the proms. They've been standing on their feet, getting their ears bashed for six weeks. It's an endurance test, and they've survived, so naturally they're celebrating. Fast cultures like fast food. You gulp it down standing up. A is also for Alka Salsa. B is for Benjamin Britten and the Beatles, two of our best musical ambassadors for kids everywhere. Yeah! C is for conductors and composers who wouldn't get very far without them. Here are my top ten favourite conductors who've done their bit for Britain and many more. Hanging by his cufflinks to number ten is Malcolm Sargent, better known as Flash Harry, who did his bit for Britain in the war. In at number nine and climbing, David Meesham with music for Mottens. There at number eight, Ted Downs, still doing his best for George Lloyd. Lucky for some, number seven and Charlie Groves. Keep up the good work, Charlie. There at number six, Bryden Thompson leading the Arnold Bax revival. Yow! And holding at number five, starry Simon Rattle with his new albums of the young Ben Britton. Number four, and it's Tommy Beecham, the man who put Delius on the map, thanks to Beecham's pills. One of the greats at number three, Barbara Olley, plugging everyone from Ireland to George Butterworth. Number two, and Adrian Bolt with complete recordings of Vaughan Williams and Algar. He is British music. And up there at number one, Sir Adrian's protege, Todd Handley, the most dynamic force in British music today, giving his all to Vaughan Williams' sixth. <laughs> A special homage to the daddy of them all, the man who put the pom in the proms, Henry J. Wood. The C is for a coward, 
British and bitter to the core, even in the Big Apple. Everyone was fair game to dear Noel, from Cole Porter to Mrs. Worthington's daughter. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. The profession is overcrowded, and the struggle is pretty tough. And admitting the fact she's burning to act, that isn't quite enough. She has nice hands to give the wretched girl her due, but don't you think her bust is too developed for her age? I repeat, Mrs. Worthington, sweet Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. She's a bit of an ugly duckling, you must honestly confess. And the width of her seat would surely defeat her chances of success. It's a loud voice. And though it's not exactly flat, she'll need a little more than that to earn a living wage. No more but, Mrs. Worthington. Not, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. D is for dancing, dames, and Delius. Annie, I've been thinking. The sooner you throw away those great Christian blinkers and get rid of all this religious humbug, the better. It has paralyzed music all along. Now, tell me, what Catholic ever wrote a piece of music worth hearing? Oh, but, Delius, what about the romantic thing that sprang from the very heart of the Catholic Church? Plain song. Dull, my boy, dull. Well, how about Haydn's oratorio, The Creation? And that wonderful passage that begins. And God created God. God? I don't know him. And don't talk to me about oratorios. Elgar wasted most of his life writing long-winded oratorios. He told me himself it was the penalty of his English environment. But he wasn't as bad as Parry. He would have set the whole Bible to music if he'd lived long enough. Oh, to be a success in England, you've got to be a second Mendelssohn. He gave the public what they wanted. Oh, rest in the Lord. My Requiem has been played in England only once. No wonder he's embittered blind and paralyzed and battered by the critics. Unwelcome in England, he spent his last years in France, still capturing in music the magic of this island like no one else before or since. In this, he was greatly helped by a fellow Yorkshireman, a budding composer called Eric Fenway, who sacrificed his own career to get down on paper three glorious works locked in Delia's frail body by paralysis. They were an odd couple, Fenby the devout Catholic, Delius the devout pagan. Only once. <laughs> and then what a fiasco. The press was outraged. They said it was a pagan cry against Christianity. <laughs> Christianity, I'm inclined to think the whole thing a myth. Human beings are incredible. They believe anything to escape reality. But one thing is certain. English music will never be any good till they get rid of Jesus. Hello, Fred, how are you? Anything dropped off today? OK, we've got to make room now for Pizza Max for Davis's Disco! for Elgar, forever associated with our second national anthem, a piece he grew to hate. It overshadowed everything else he ever wrote. It haunted him to the grave. His critics never forgave him for Land of Hope and Glory, though he didn't write the words and strongly disapproved of them. He died a forgotten man, almost friendless. But not quite. His very last composition was a heartfelt tribute to a constant companion who understood the real man more than any of the superior beings who reviled him. 
The piece was called Minna. Minna was a Cairn Terrier. And drummer boy. The real Algar remains as enigmatic as the variations that made him an international figure. There are 41 recorded versions of the Enigma variations in today's catalogue, and Algar is undoubtedly our greatest and most loved composer. Or is he? This is the place where Algar wrote some of his most glorious music, including the two symphonies, the violin concerto, the kingdom, and the introduction and allegro for strings. Perhaps you'd like to take another look at the building. Maybe your last chance. In two weeks' time, it could easily be bulldozed into the ground. A block of officers going up called Algar House, probably. Or it could equally well fall down. There are huge holes in the roof, and the basement's flooded out. We must do something quickly before it's too late. I made that appeal several years ago on this very program. And I think it was seen by about two million viewers. And do you know how much we raised? Do you know how much England raised for that appeal? For their greatest composer? Fifteen pounds. Yes. You may well yawn, my son. That's how much this country treasures its greatest composer. You couldn't get a ticket to see Alton John for 15 pounds. I don't have much money, but boy, if I did, I'd buy a big house where we both could live. F is for film music. Scott of the Antarctic, Paul Williams, Henry V, William Walton, The Overlanders, John Ireland. Classic film scores that have a life apart from celluloid. The one that set the pace was Things to Come by Arthur Bliss. Here's a musical picture composed in 1936 of Every Town in 2036. <laughs>
50 years ago, Arthur Bliss needed a symphony orchestra of 80 players for that music, plus a recording studio as big as that stately home. But today, things are changing. It's back to the keyboard, as in the days of the silent movies, with a little help from the microchip. Here's Thomas Dolby, a kinetic one-man band, at work on the score for my latest feature film, Gothic. also for festivals, usually organised to boost the local economy or somebody's ego. Edinburgh's the biggest, the three choirs the oldest. Choirs, mostly amateur, kept music moving through the doldrums of the 19th century with gusty choral works commissioned from fresh young talents like Mr Elgar. Here's my top ten favourites, starting off with a new entry into the lists, The Black Knight by Mr Elgar. Number one. for girls who grow up to become soloists but rarely symphonic composers. Why? Opposition from the men? That was certainly the case with Dame Ethel Smythe. She conducted a chorus of fellow suffragettes singing her best known work, The March of the Women, through the bars of her Holloway prison cell with a toothbrush. Kate Bush. 
Bush and Dame Ethel Smythe, a dynamic duo. But is that the lot? No, there are a few more, most of them still struggling to get a hearing at 80. Here's Proud Thames by Liz McConkie. H is for host. Here or below, host gets everywhere. Or at least its planets do. It's the most universally played British orchestral piece ever. Here is Mercury, symbolizing man's flight through the elements. Church of the Iron Maid. Punk and pop, come and go. Heavy metals forever. Head bangers, turn up your ear and eyes. you know my Traditional ballad, gentlemen soldier. Soldier, as a sentry he did stand, he saluted a fair maiden by a waving of his hand. And then he boldly kissed her and he cast it off as a joke. He drilled her up in a sentry box, strapped up in a soldier's cloak. And the drums are going around, and the boys still out to play. Fairly well, Polly, me dear, I must be gone away. And the drums are going around, and the boys still out to play. Fairly well, Polly, me dear, I must be gone away. J is for jazz, and here's the fairer sax in the fast lane. <laughs>
is for Catelby and Kitch. able to transport us to foreign lands, Albert Catelby did it with his music. In the mystic land of Egypt, in a Persian market, were family favorites on every bandstand in the land. Now, just close your eyes and imagine you're in a Chinese temple garden. <laughs> when it takes itself too serious, like. slow movement of Sir Michael Tippett's Third Symphony. Phony jazz and phony blues from Sir Michael in search of a meaningful metaphor. Ah, excuse me. Hello. Well, it's either a sex pervert or at the opening of Sir Michael Tippett's Fourth Symphony. L is for Lloyd Webber with hits like Cats, Tell Me on a Sunday, Starlight Express, Phantom of the Opera, and Cricket, to his credit, Andrew is the biggest success story in music today. Before him, the British musical never played further south than the pier at South End. Now, it's one of our biggest exports. Brother Julian, aided by his cello, has rediscovered and recorded more British music than any instrumentalist in the land, including In the Half Life by his father, William Lloyd Webber which he's recorded with John Lill.
At the third stroke, it will be half past kissing time. M is for modern. This is the music of Cornelius. Cardew. Cornelius Cardew was one of the gurus of modern music. It's the sort of music that's been modern for some time. There's modern music everywhere and always has been. You just have to tune in. Echoes from Giles Swain's Cry, Brian Eno's music for airports, Gavin Breyer's The Sinking of the Titanic. And now for a shopping song by the mad king of modern music, Peter Maxwell Davis. <laughs> N for neglect. Unsung heroes rest here uneasily. Buried alive by the critics for being insular and unfashionable. We suffered too, and for years were forbidden the pleasure of their music. Music by such names as Sir Arnold Bax, composer of luscious romantic music inspired by Celtic legend, the sea, and women. Alan Rawsthorne had a big hit in the war with his Street Corner Overture and set Elliot's cats to music when Andrew Lloyd Webber was a babe in arms. His second piano concerto was written for the optimistic days of the Festival of Britain.
Frank Bridge, whose sunlit vision darkened with the Great War, becoming mournful and elegiac. Many composers never made it through the war, including the great George Butterworth. The lucky ones were only wounded like E.J. Moran, who wrote a fine symphony about his birthplace, Norfolk. set on many more neglected composers, including Sir Granville Bantock, who wrote a fine Hebridean symphony, and Lord Berners, who wrote a funeral march for his pet goldfish, and Gerald Finzi, a unique voice in English choral music, and Sir Eugene Goosens, whose career came to an end with a pornography charge. And then there's Patrick Hadley, Joseph Holbrook, Herbert Howells, George Lloyd, Edmund Rubra, and Cyril Scott. All neglected, all talented. John Ireland most of all. Here's a fragment of the music he wrote for the film, The Overlanders. <laughs> All this music's available, thanks mainly to small companies like Mr. Itter's Lyrita label. Sound the trumpets, the resurrection has come, the dead are restored to life. Give thanks for Richard Itter, a lonely prophet in the wilderness who instead of crying out, put his hand deep in his pocket to finance recordings of their works. After two decades, his sacrifice has borne fruit. Other companies have also seen the light. Rejoice, the record shops brimmeth over. Let us play British. O is for opera. There's opera in the north, and opera north. Or if you want to go further, Scottish opera. There's opera in the west, with an East German accent, of Welsh national opera. There's opera in the east, with Kent. In the south, there's opera in English at the E-N-O. And for Gormes, at Kleinburn. Here, at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, there's opera for the royals and the rich. But there's not much British opera about Sometimes it's not hard to understand why. Do you accept my challenge? Lifted to such lofty heights. This is killing.
Tippett's Midsummer Marriage. Camp and obscure, and a great favorite with the British critics who never tire of trying to force us to grovel before its profundity. Benjamin Britten's operas are held in high critical esteem here too, but I'm not so highly thought of abroad, where audiences are less enthusiastic about child abuse, gay may queens, and aging pederasts. The greatest opera of modern times, Troilus and Cressida, was a simple story of heterosexual love. Naturally, it was savaged by the critics here, but Walton was too big a man to bury, so they drove him into exile instead, and his music with him. Listen to what we're missing. He never lived to see a good production. But we might. Come along, you British opera houses. We've OD'd on Wagner and Verdi. Let's have some Walton and Vaughan Williams. O is also for ornithology. British music's full of birds, larks, cuckoos, ravens, doves, sparrows, and even swans. Hamilton Harty set to music an Irish myth telling of three princesses who were transformed into swans off the wild coast of North Antrim. And here to entertain us is Eric Parkin, who has found in our keyboard repertory music as lush as Rachmaninoff, as delicate as Debussy, and as quirky as Satie. This is the Joker from the Four Aces Suite by that great British genius, the English Gershwin, Billy Mayerl. days, the name Billy Mayo was a household word. Everybody loved Billy, from mums and dads to the bright young things. It's not hard to understand why.
is for Punk and Purcell, who wrote Oh Pretty Youth. <laughs> And R is for the Queen and rock and roll. Love them or hate them, you can't escape them. George the Sixth even dragged mm. <laughs> poor old Algar out of retirement to write a piece for the kiddies. Listen to this movement from his nursery suite. This will take you back, Mum.
for Scotland. The land of the haggis and the thistle. And Ron Rigg playing Gum Nagala with Sheila McNaughty on the sword. <laughs> of the border, Essis was Sullivan and Gilbert. Together they brought the Japanese to the Savoy. soloists who've given me most kicks over the years. So it's thanks to James Galway and his golden flute. And to Edith Sitwell and her facade. Boots up, walk, tall as a stalk. Before the honey fruits are drawn, the right foot walk and stalk. The gun, the renard colored sun, among the pheasant feathered corny unicorn, a stone forlorn, the spot faced sheep, sit and sleep. Fairy weak as William and Mary weep. Sally Mary back, what's the matter? Why he cried? The huntsman, the renard colored sun, on my side. Oh, the nursery maid, Meg, with the leg like a peg. Chase the feathered dreams like hens, and when they laid an egg, and three cheers for the flying cello of Julian Lloyd Webber, playing everything from host to Webber. Fond memories of Kathleen Ferrier, the most glamorous voice ever. And a big thank you to Julian Bream and his guitar playing Malcolm Arnold. treasured moment, Yehudi Menuhin playing Walton's viola concerto. And three cheers for Eric Parkin and his Britstein grand. A 
Jacqueline Dupre, the queen of cellists, and her unforgettable way with Algar. And Thea King and her clarinet, playing Finzi. Musician of the Year, last year, this year, and every year, Nigel Kennedy with the first TV performance of Zigai by David Heath and Nigel Kennedy. <laughs> is also for Tippet. What a relief. No message. U is for... Ugh. Critics. I find Elgar essentially derivative. What do you say, Oliver? For me, Milton, his second symphony is a lengthy, pompous, bourgeois sort of thing. 
As for Delius, he's a provincial Debussy. Delius is the musical equivalent of Blumange and backs of bath sorts, according to Des. What a performance. The ornate bath filled to the brim with richly scented water, which overflowed and at last glugged, glugged to a noisy conclusion. <laughs> The Garden of Fand, Tintagel, and November Woods are oppressive rather than impressive. True, Percy. Almost as bad as Vaughan Williams' wasp overture. <laughs> Sounds like Rimsky Korsakoff with Bola, Macintosh, and Umbrella. Well said, Paul. Have you heard his fourth symphony, Neville? Empty cacophony. Deathly. A man might as well hang himself as look in that work for a great tune or a theme. As for the Antarctica, complete artistic failure. Oliver. These are some of the opinions held by our most distinguished critics. Milton Cross, Oliver Downs, A.J.P. Taylor, B. Levin, Desmond Shaw Taylor, Percy M. Young, Paul Henry Lang, Neville Cardus, and Oliver Neighbour. And don't let us forget William Glock and his pals at the BBC, who for over ten years kept the music of a generation of British composers out of the proms and off the air. And U is for underrated. Havergal Bryan, born in 1876 of working class parents, totally ignored, wrote five operas, eight choral works, and 32 symphonies, died in a council flat in Shoreham, Sussex in 1972, aged 96. is for Vaughan Williams, who treasured our musical heritage from Tudor composers to recent folk song. The riches show in his music. Here, the owner Brown plays The Lark Ascending. is also for video, and Elton John doing his bit for Glasnost. In a guitar, is it cold? In your little corner of the world You could roll around the globe And never find soul to know Oh, I saw you by the wall Ten of your ten soldiers in a row With eyes that look like ice on fire The human heart, the captive in the snow And if there comes a time No longer hold you in And if you're free to make a choice 
just look towards the west and find a friend. Oh, Nakita, you will never know anything about my home. I'll never know how good it feels to hold you. W is for Wales and Welsh choirs who sing in Welsh, but here's a song by a smaller group, Ber Koch. And that brings us to X, Y, Z. X is for xylophone. Y is for youth. And Z is for Zadok the Priest by Georges Frédéric Handel. But he was German. <laughs> <laughs> we'll soon fix that. my ABC of British music. For too long and far too often, the best of our music's been ignored and undervalued. But this country's produced pastoral music like no other. Its unique quality is inspired by and instilled with the spirit of the British countryside, which is the best thing about Britain anyway. It should be cherished and celebrated. Bye-bye.